I want to thank you for tuning into our broadcast today. We've got another great service in store for you. Each week we are seeing new people being drawn into the presence of God. Now, when I came to faith in Christ, there were three things that caused me to follow him. First of all, I felt his presence real strong. Secondly, I saw his power at work. And finally, I heard the truth of God's word. For the past 26 years, we've been committed to seeing lives transformed through these same three principles. We need your help to bring this life-changing experience to a generation that so desperately needs a foundation of faith. Now, if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please let us know. You can contact us or partner with us through our website at libertychurchmi.com. Take a minute and check it out. Now here's today's message. I hope you enjoy it. We're going to begin our journey today as we continue our series, Oceans. We're going to uh, talk this morning about uh, using your gifts for God. You know, we have four foundational things that we've always kind of built our church upon that we feel are very important in the life of a believer. Relationships with one another, which we talked about last week. Your relationship with God, which we'll probably focus on next week. Uh, we believe in the teaching of God's word, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. And using your gifts, what God puts in you, letting it flow out of you for his purposes. And we're gonna talk about that this morning. You know, I am a deep thinker sometimes. Sometimes I get lost in my own thoughts. And I think about things maybe average people don't think about. You know, in, in a Christian world, sometimes people think about creation and Adam and, uh, you know, did he, Adam have a belly button, that type of stuff. Well, I go a little bit deeper when I think about things. Like yesterday, I've been eating eggs in the morning. I, I love eggs. And, you know, you crack open an egg, and I, I thought to myself, who was the first person to see an egg come out of a, a chicken or an animal and think to open that up and cook it and eat it? You know, that, that, that to me is a, just a little bit strange that somebody would, would see something come out of the rear end of an animal and say, you know what, let me open this and eat what's inside. Did you ever think about that before? But we do it all of the time. Or the first person to walk up to a cow and grab a hold of its udders and begin to squeeze and take what comes out of that and say, mm, let's drink that and, and see how it tastes. But yet, milk is a very basic staple uh, of our diet. Or the first person to reach into a beehive and pull honey out, right? And, and, and say, wow, this must be something that's good to eat. Or the first person to look at, at fish eggs and, and take them and eat it, but yet caviar, I've never had, but they say it, it, it's very good, you know? It takes somebody with vision, I guess, somebody that uh, maybe heard from God to be able to see resources in something that we never would have thought were there. I can't help but think about uh, Tom Brady, you know, this year's Super Bowl winner, uh, who somebody saw something in him that nobody else saw. He was an average quarterback at the University of Michigan, drafted 199th in the 2000 draft, but yet has won, what, seven Super Bowls now and is, without a doubt, the greatest of all time when it comes to quarterbacks. And so what I want to talk to you about this morning is seeing things in people or, or, or resources in places maybe that other people never see. And we're going to talk about the story of David and his calling, starting here in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we're going to not uh, read the entire chapter, but we're going to hit several verses here this morning, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel was the prophet, he said, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I provided myself a king among his sons. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab, which was Jesse's oldest son, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or his physical stature because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Samuel said, are all the young men here? Jesse said, well, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, 
for we will not sit down until he comes. So he sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Saul was the king of Israel. Saul was uh, uh, the first king that Israel ever had. Israel was ruled by God in a way that most nations were not governed. And they wanted to be like other nations. Israel started to complain. They wanted to have a king like most of the other nations. And they began to ask God, God, can we have a king? God didn't want it to be that way. But sometimes God will let us do what we want to do. I think sometimes just to prove a point. And so after a while of the people complaining, the people begging God, God allowed them to have a king. And so number one, Saul was the people's choice. You've heard of the People's Choice Awards. He was the very first winner of the People's Choice Awards. And it talks about Saul in uh, the ninth chapter here of 1 Samuel. It's starting in verse 1. It says, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among all the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So it describes Saul here, and this is what the people saw in him, that his dad was a mighty man of power, that he came from a great pedigree, that he had a, a, a great lineage, a great family, that he was his choice son, that he was more handsome than all of the Israelites, that he was taller. When you looked out among the crowd of people, Saul, it says, stood head and shoulders, taller than anyone else. And it says that God directed Samuel to Saul because Israel desired him. You know, I, I looked through these scriptures and it didn't really say anywhere that God said, I've chosen Saul. It says that God said, Samuel, go and anoint him because Israel has chosen him. Israel has desired him. And so it, Saul was Israel's choice. And if you know the history of Israel, he failed miserably as a king. He was a terrible king. He got into ways of wickedness. And I believe that God was trying to teach Israel a lesson. And God says here that he rejected Saul and he sends Samuel to find a new king. Samuel goes to the house of Jesse in the city of Bethlehem. Anybody know about the city of Bethlehem? Somebody else coming from the city of Bethlehem? And so he comes to the house of Jesse and, and they have this time of sacrifice. And he says, Jesse, bring me your sons, because God has directed me here to find the next king among your sons. And one by one, Jesse brings his sons out to Samuel. He brings the oldest. He brings the best looking. He brings the smartest. He brings the strongest. Seven of his eight sons he brings to Samuel to examine. And one by one, God speaks, and he says, this isn't the one. I've rejected this one. This isn't the one. No, this one isn't the one. And finally, God speaks. I think he was kind of frustrated because Samuel wasn't thinking like God wanted him to think. He was using the method that they used to choose Saul. They were looking on the outward appearance. And he says, I don't look on the outward appearance. Don't look at the physical realm. Don't look at his strength. Don't look at his, his physical qualifications. Don't look at his education. Don't look at the things on the outward appearance. God says, I'm looking for a person based on what's on the inside. Well, how many of you know it's difficult sometimes to see what's on the inside of a person? If you've ever interviewed somebody for a job or tried to hire somebody, you look at their resume, you look at their qualifications, you invite them in to do an interview, and basically, all you can really look at is, is the outside. You don't know what's in their heart. You don't know what their work ethic is going to be like, what their loyalty is going to be like, what their honesty is going to be like, what their character. You can't really see that from the outside. But God sees things. God looks beneath the surface. God says here, I don't see as man sees. And this is part of what I believe the Lord was speaking to us prophetically through worship this morning is that he wants us to begin to walk in a different realm, in a different world, where we begin to see as God sees, where we see things beneath the surface, beneath the, 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 the facade, beneath the exterior, 
Because I believe, number three, God's resources lie beneath the surface. That God has great resources that he wants to utilize in all of us that are beneath the surface. Everyone saw David as small and insignificant. It seemed as if Jesse didn't even want to bring him out to show him to Samuel. He said, I'm my youngest one. We kind of told him to go keep himself busy watching the sheep. Samuel said, I'm not leaving till I've looked at all of your son, sons. And so finally, almost embarrassed about David being his son, Jesse brings him out for Samuel to look at. But yet, David became the greatest king that Israel ever had. They couldn't see it on the outside. They would not have thought it, just like you would have never thought of, uh, of eating what was on the inside of an egg until somebody else did it. They would have never thought David, the youngest, the little boy from a small city like Bethlehem, could become the greatest king, so great that Jesus himself is called the son of David. Jesus identified with him. Jesus took on his name and his identity, saying, I am the son of David. I want to encourage you this morning that you all are an ocean of unseen resources. And that until we begin to look past the exterior, past the physical realm, past what's on the outside, we will never see the things that God has placed on the inside of you. There are things in you that people cannot see. There are things in you that you cannot see. And I believe God is speaking this morning, and he's wanting to draw those things out of you. He's wanting to reveal those things. He's wanting to use those things for his glory and for his purposes. There's no doubt in my mind that God has a great calling for our church, that God has called us to make an impact in this city, but in order to make a great impact, we need great resources. And I believe those resources are right here. And a lot of them are, 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 are hidden in unseen resources. There are a lot of areas right now that we could use some resources. I, I said it when we first moved in here that I, I believe we're going to grow to a point where we're going to need to have multiple types of services, which means, means we need to, to duplicate ministry in a lot of our teams. We need to have... Uh, an uh, abundant amount of musicians and tech people and children's workers and nursery workers and things like that. And some of you, those gifts are in you. When I came to faith in Christ, I was a pretty shy, quiet, introverted young man. And the thought of standing here and teaching in front of a, a group of people and that there was a gift inside of me to be able to do that I never saw. It was one of the furthest things from my mind. But yet I believe that because I had the courage to step out and say, God, use me, God began to bring those resources to the surface. And I pray this is what God will begin to do in your life. I think of the story of the disciples and Peter in particular in John chapter 21. We're going to start reading in verse 3. This is after Jesus had died on the cross. He had risen from the grave. He had shown himself to the disciples. But yet it was very challenging to be a Christian at that time. Many of their lives were threatened. They thought that since the people had killed Jesus, that they were marked, that they would be also hauled off and executed, possibly crucified just like Jesus was. And so many of his followers, so many of his close followers, even his disciples, we'll see here, were not sure that they wanted to continue to do. Even after Jesus rose from the dead and showed himself to the disciples, they're not sure they still want to follow the movement that Jesus had started. And it says in verse 3 of John chapter 21, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out into the boat, they caught nothing all night. And at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, hey, fellas, uh, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. 
Then he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll get some. And so they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Basically, in this story, what you see is Peter, who was a fisherman, who had left his nets, James and John as well, and others, who had left their families and left their vocation and, and, and had a commitment to follow Jesus. If you remember the story, when he called his disciples, he found them fishing, he found them working, and he said, come and follow me. I will make you fishers of men. I will take those resources, I will take those gifts, I will take those talents, and I will use them for the purpose of my kingdom, for the purpose of changing lives, for the purpose of doing the work of the ministry of God. And they left their nets, and they left their vocation, and they left their businesses, they left their families, and they followed Jesus. And now we see Peter making a statement. He says, I'm going back to fishing. I'm going back to my old life. I'm going back to my old way. I'm going back to doing what I used to do. And the Lord finds them. In fact, several of the disciples said, we'll, we'll come with you. And they're out there in the boat and they're fishing. It says all night long they fished in the darkness. And they caught nothing. And then at dawn, they see a silhouette of a man on the shore. I don't know, maybe the sun was rising behind him and they couldn't see his face. They didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus kind of taunts them, hey, hey, fellas, have you caught anything? He knows they hadn't. They said, no, we, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. I don't know, I would have said, buzz off, bozo. We've been casting the nets on every side of the boat. There ain't no fish out here. I mean, I love to fish, but if you ain't catching anything, it could be one of the most frustrating things in the world. But they did. They put the net on the right side of the boat. And they couldn't even pull the net up because it had so much fish in it. What do you mean, Pastor? What are you talking about? See, I believe Peter had abandoned ministry. I believe that Peter had gone back to using his gifts for his own personal gain. I believe that this story is kind of a parallel to the story of Saul, that he was doing what he wanted to do. Saul became king because that's what the people wanted. They began to look on the outward things and say, you know what, we need to go back to the physical realm. We need to go back to doing things in, in the way that we used to do them. Saul was Israel's choice because they wanted to be like the rest of the world. So the motives of Israel for making Saul their king was wrong. And the motives here of the disciples to going back to fishing was wrong. And what they're saying is we're going to begin to take our gifts and our talents We've been using him for a few years for your kingdom, for your purposes, God. But now we're going to be, go back and use them for our own personal benefit. They did that all night, and it gained them nothing. They got nowhere. Are you all with me this morning? And then Jesus says, hey, fellas, why don't you listen to me for just a minute? Follow my direction for just a minute. Do what I'm asking you to do. And when they did that, all of a sudden, fish came from everywhere. What are you trying to say? What I'm saying to you this morning is fish where Jesus tells you to, and your nets will be filled. Use the resources that God has given you for his kingdom and for his glory. And there will be an abundance in your life that you never thought possible. When their motives were wrong, they couldn't even see Jesus. They couldn't even recognize Jesus. And you know, God has placed in us so many gifts and talents and abilities. But when we're not using them for the right purpose, we're not fishing on the right side of the boat. And our life will be frustrating, empty, unfulfilled. And I want to tell you, for me, there is this principle of fulfillment that I, I don't think you'll hear it talked about too much 
in the church. But fulfillment to me is a big part of what our life is all about. I thought about that word this week, fulfill, fulfillment, to be full, fill. Aren't those two words very similar, full and fill, right? What does that mean? I believe that all of us are born with an, a void, an emptiness on the inside. And that God has a plan for our life to fill that void, to fulfill that emptiness. And that he gives us things. He equips us with things. That when we do those things and we use those things in the right way, our nets will be filled. Our life will be filled. It will bring incredible fulfillment to our life. Have you ever done something that just was very unfulfilling? You ever worked jobs that you felt like, what am I doing? I worked a job in advertising for many years. And one of the first things I did was we created junk mail. I spent hours every day creating advertising circulars that you would get in the mail that most of you threw in the trash. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm creating trash. <laughs> Spending hours every day making things that people would throw out. It was so unfulfilling to me because it wasn't what God was calling me to do. And there were gifts in me, and I was using those gifts, but I was using them just to pay the bills, just to put food on the table. And there's nothing wrong. You've got to take care of your family. But realize and recognize that God has placed those gifts in you for an eternal purpose, for a purpose that transcends just the paycheck. And so many people, that's their entire life, is wrapped up in making a paycheck to pay their bills. And they wonder why they're miserable. They wonder why they're empty. They wonder why they feel like their life lacks meaning and purpose and fulfillment. Because all you're doing is you're living on the surface. You're living in a physical realm. And there are a lot of things beneath the surface that you've never tapped into. I told you I've been studying a lot about the ocean because of this series. And the resources that lie beneath the ocean are amazing. And so many of them we're, we're aware of today. But do you know that it was a long time before many of those resources were ever known? Do you know that God created Adam and he put him in the garden? And if you read in the book of Genesis, it says that he gave him every tree and herb for food. And man lived that way, eating from the trees up until the time of the flood of Noah. 1,650 years, most people would say in a timeline. There was an ocean out there and other resources in the earth that man never tapped into until the flood came. I'm not sure they even had a boat that anybody had ever been out on the water until God had spoke to Noah and said, build a boat. And then after the flood, God sat Noah down and he began to change things. He said, I want you to begin to eat from the animals and from the fish that are in the sea. I'm not sure that anybody even knew there were fish in the sea. If you never had a boat, if all you did was stand on the shore and look out at the surface of the ocean, how did you know what was in the ocean? And see, this is how we live our life. We're so superficial. And we live everything on the surface. And there's resources that we don't even know are there because we never try to tap into them. The flood was obviously a tragic event. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes tragedy for us to discover that there are other things in our life that we need to tap into. There were things there that man didn't know existed until God spoke. This morning, I want you to know there are things in you that you don't even know exist. And God is speaking and telling you through me prophetically today 
to begin to tap into those resources. Begin to search beneath the surface. Begin to see that in this room there are gifts of administration and teaching, creative gifts, things that you've been afraid. Is it possible that man was afraid to go out on the water? They didn't know how to swim? And sometimes we're afraid to delve into what's inside of us. I was afraid to stand up in front of people and talk. But you need to begin to go beneath the surface and confront things and begin to look at them. And today we enjoy crab, and lobster, seafood, fish, all kinds of wonderful things that are beneath the surface of the ocean that they didn't eat off or feed off of for over 1,600 years. In fact, today, 200 billion pounds of food come from the ocean each year. What a great resource that is. How many of you like seafood? Calamari, anybody like the little octopus, oysters, things like that? Do you know it wasn't until 1897, now we're talking about 4,000 years in the Old Testament, 1897, you know, almost 5,000 years it took before man discovered there was oil in the ocean. That they began to drill beneath the surface. Really, it was only a few years before that that they discovered oil in the earth and began to drill for it. And yet today, those resources in the ocean provide so much. It caused an industrial revolution in our world to run engines and machinery and, and, and home heating and, and, and lighting and all the things that we have, all the energy, everything that's run by energy today. Almost 5,000 years we went without those things until somebody discovered at the deepest part of the ocean, at the, at the floor of the ocean, that there was a great resource that propelled us forward in ways that man for thousands of years never dreamed possible. So for years, the ocean existed without, I believe, fulfilling the purpose that God had designed it for. Up until that point, it was just something to look at. I believe that God has brought you here for a purpose. Not just to be someone to look at, but to be a gift, to be a resource, to be used, to change lives, to encourage people, to teach children, to lead us into the presence of God in a deeper way, to help us to change this city and to change the world. The Bible says that David was a great man because he was in touch with the heart of God. What is the heart of God for your life? You need to find it and begin to walk in it because true fulfillment comes from allowing what is in you to flow out of you for the purpose of helping other people. I'll say that again. True fulfillment comes from finding what is in you and allowing it to flow out of you for the purpose of helping other people. If all you do is let things come into you and never allow things to flow out of you, I don't feel you'll ever find true fulfillment the way God wants you to. There's a body of water in the Middle East called the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in it. Nothing can, can exist, no life can exist in the Dead Sea. Do you know why? because it has no outflow. Things flow into it, but nothing flows out of it. And what comes in just becomes stagnant, and life dies and ceases to exist. You're here this morning, and I believe God is imparting things into you. As you read his word, as you pray, as you get closer to the Lord, he puts things in you. And I'm challenging you this morning to allow those things to begin to flow out of you. Because until you do, you won't find true fulfillment in life. God doesn't call us 
to just exist. God calls us to a purpose. God calls us to look beneath the surface of who we are and to find the gifts and the abilities and the resources that other people can't see, but God knows they're there. And he wants to reveal them to us as we pursue him. In Acts chapter 13, my last passage this morning, verse 22, it says that he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave this testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. See, I believe that a person after God's heart will begin to see with God's eyes. That as you pursue the heart of God, again, that requires us to go deep beneath the surface. God is a spiritual being. We are spiritual beings. So you have to get down into the heart of God, connecting with him through your spirit. And he will begin to show you the gifts that he's placed in you. He says, David was a man that was after my heart. And because he was after God's heart, there was a desire to do the will of God. There's a will that God has for your life. There's a purpose. There's a plan. There's gifts in this room this morning. A treasure chest of abilities just waiting to be tapped that will change not only this church, not only the world, but will change you. Because I believe that until we begin to be used by God to change the lives of others, we will never experience the change that God wants to affect in our own life. I'll say that again. Until we begin to use what God has placed in us to change the lives of others, we will never experience the change that God desires to take place in our own lives. I've been a Christian for many years. And the greatest joy, the greatest fulfillment that I've ever received in life is by being used by God to help other people. It's changed my life more than anything. I've sat in church. I've sat in services. I sat through two years of Bible school, taking in, taking in, taking in, taking in, feeling like I was going to explode. And you can only learn so much by just sitting and receiving. But you can grow and learn so much more by doing, by putting into practice the things that are within you, the seeds that have been planted by letting them bear fruit in your life. It's awfully quiet in here this morning. I hope that God is speaking to you today. And I want to challenge you to begin to step out, to begin to look down deep, begin to pursue the heart of God. God, what is your desire for my life? Why have you wired me this way, God? What are the things that are, are, are deep within the surface of me that maybe I don't even know are there? Let me hear your voice, God. Let me speak. Uh, uh, will you speak to me today, Lord? Like you spoke to Noah and said, begin to go beneath the surface and tap into resources. Let's pray. Father, I come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your word today. God, I pray for a release of gifts and talents and abilities, of resources. Lord, I've watched so many people that, like Peter and the disciples, serve you for a little while, but then fall away because they lack fulfillment. You grabbed a hold of Peter and some of the other disciples and change their focus. You challenged Peter. You challenged his love for you. Told him to begin to feed your sheep and it radically changed his life. 
Miracles started happening through him. People were healed. The world was shaken. I pray, God, that if there are those here this morning that have untapped resources, that are only using them for personal gain, God, that they would begin to go into a realm and an area of their life where they're being used for your glory and for your honor. Challenge them to step out of their comfort zones today, Lord. Begin to seek you and serve you like never before, Father. Hallelujah. The first step in experiencing God is to open your heart, to crack that shell, that exterior, and to invite him to take control of your life, to speak to you, to guide you, to lead you. That's the beginning of that relationship, of hearing from God, being a person after his heart. I want to ask you today to look at your heart. Does, does God live there? Because that's the greatest resource, is the presence of God. That is what will be the catalyst the energy behind everything that you do. If you do it in your own strength, you'll be like the fishermen fishing all night and getting nowhere. But if you begin to allow God to come alive in you, you'll begin to see those resources that lie beneath the surface. I'm going to challenge you right now to put aside your fear and your pride. Say this prayer with us together watching us online open your heart to God today because only through God will you find true fulfillment in life he created you he's the only one that can fill that emptiness on the inside of you say this with me say God I open my heart and I invite you to take control of my life God I believe that there's an emptiness in me that only you can fill. I receive you today as my Savior and my Lord. Come and lead me and fill me today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, again, if you're new to us here this morning, whether you're watching online or you're here in the auditorium today, fill out that connection card uh, through our website, Liberty Church MI dot com slash connect stop by our connection counter outside uh, we've got a free gift for you if you're here in person with us don't forget next sunday is connection sunday and i want to challenge you if you're a regular church member here this is a, a day for you to invite somebody to bring somebody with you uh, and help to introduce them to what god is doing here in the church we'll have a reception afterwards i answer questions get better acquainted so think about that this week who you can bring back with you next sunday Dig deep down inside and uh, use those gifts to be able to lure people and, and draw people into the kingdom of God. God bless you. We love you. Don't forget our reception for our middle school, high school families after the service this morning down in our student center. Have a great day. Tomorrow is March 1st. Spring is coming. Be excited about that. God bless you.